Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am very excited for this week's episode as I've got a guest from China joining me on the show. And we're actually covering multiple time zones as part of this episode as Bjarne is in Shanghai. Uh, Wyatt, uh, the podcast producer, is in Malta, a country in Europe. And may, why, maybe we'll have to jump into that on another episode on, on why you're in Malta. That's, I hadn't even heard of that until you had moved moved there uh so you're there and then i'm in north america so we're covering three different time zones i believe it's three o'clock in the morning for bjarne so we're going to just jump right into this as i've got a lot of questions to ask him about china's industrial market and then we're also going to talk about some of the tech that they're already using in china there's a lot of futurists that try to predict what's going to happen and you'll see that there's already self-driving cars there there's already drone delivery so we're going to talk about a number of those things as well and then what we can expect in in western markets as well and it's a live show so if you have any questions please feel free to jump in and we'll get bjarne to explain uh, as ma- or answer as many as we can uh, as we're going through there so Wyatt, if you could please bring on bjarne bjarne good to see you my friend hello good to see you so correct me if i'm wrong but you've been in china now for 11 years Actually, even longer, even longer. Uh, probably that's an outdated bio. So I'm here since 2004. So that's 19 years. 19 years. So it's been seven or it's eight years since you've updated your bio. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good reminder. I should do that urgently, I guess. Uh, and then you had previously come from Germany, right? Correct. As you can hear from my accent, I guess. So are, are you a little unique being in China, uh, being German with a German accent, living in Shanghai? Yes and no. I mean, when I'm back home in Germany and people ask, where do you live? And I say, I live in China and I speak the language. That's like, wow, that's unique. But of course, when you look around here, Shanghai is a big city, 24 million people. You have a certain uh, foreign population, not quite as big, let's say, as in New York, but you have thousands and thousands of foreigners and those foreigners that live here a long time often do study and learn some of the language so it's not one is not all that special in a big city like shanghai or beijing shenzhen or guangzhou but as you go inside inside uh, the country more more to the countryside yes then then people stare at you before we get into china's industrial market how many languages do you speak then uh, good question. Basically four, I should say, because German, obviously my mother tongue and then English and French, which I learned in school and then Chinese. I also speak uh, some Norwegian, which is very funny and interesting because my name is Norwegian. Otherwise, we don't have family ties to Norway. But then eventually I, I studied uh, quite a bit of Norwegian. So if you count that as well, then it's five. What are you speaking mostly when you're in China? Actually, English. Because while the clients and landlords and developers, investors are often Chinese people, they are often Chinese directors and managers working for multinational companies where the main language is uh, English. So uh, with some developers, with construction companies, with local governments, I would speak Mandarin. But with clients, with investors, no matter it's buyers or tenants of buildings, no matter it's users or investors, it's, it's mostly English. Wow. Yeah, you're a man of many talents to be speaking <laughs> almost five languages. That's quite, that's quite impressive. Uh, right, I so saw that uh, Harry had joined in. He said he's looking forward to this interview. Thanks for joining in, Harry. And if you have any questions for Briarney, please throw them in the chat as well. So I'm very curious myself because I, I like to cover North America's industrial market quite well. I try to keep a finger on the pulse of all the major markets, but I know very little about China's industrial market and very little about China in general, other than there's a few balloons floating over North America right, right now. And I don't have the security clearance to uh, to talk about that. There was one question that came in before we started about, uh, there was a, it was a two-part question. One part was about the balloons, which we were we're not going to talk about i think he was being facetious anyways and then the other one was uh he was curious about how rents compare presumably to north america so could you just give me an overview on on the world's factory uh talking about the manufacturing space you can talk about the, how big the market is whatever you want and how you'd give an overview of china's industrial market 
Sure, sure. I mean, it is obviously humongous. And the interesting thing was China started to become like the world's factory in something like, I think, the 80s, 90s. So about 30 years, 30 something years ago. But that was possible because China had at that point in time just been going through an industrialization for themselves. So they had just started building factories in their own country for their own use. So and they had logistics and they had raw materials and all of that. So they were kind of ready. And that brings us like fast forward to today where you have companies saying, well, why not now that China is getting more expensive? Why not I set up another spot in Vietnam, in Thailand, in Malaysia, in any of these Southeast Asian tiger states or whatever you want to call them. And that is good and well. And you say, yes, the salary level may be lower and so on. But do you have the infrastructure there? Do you have the legal infrastructure, the technical infrastructure, the financial infrastructure? Do you have suppliers? Do you have raw materials? And all of that makes it that China is very hard to beat. We had a number of companies. They have like 10, 20 factories in China. Now they said, OK, let's get one in Indonesia and one here and there. And they tend to find it very frustrating. And I'm not saying everything is super easy in China, but in comparison, you know. And of course, China has also changed over the 20 years that I have been here here. For example, a while ago, um, the Apple CEO said, look, we are producing in China, not predominantly because of the cheap labor cost, but because we can find skilled workers and large amounts of skilled workers. And that's what we need. And large amount of engineers graduating from universities, hungry for jobs, not expecting the job level that you would have in the US or Canada or Western Europe but actually also not, not as low as you would think. You know, uh, Some years ago, China was at a similar level with India. You had a similar GDP level per capita, GDP per capita as in India, and now it's five times higher than India. So China has put itself, put itself quite successfully into a quite strong position. And of course, looking at it on a per capita basis, China is still way behind the US in terms of economic output. But if you take it in total figures, you take 200 million uh, Americans or 300 and 1.4 or 5 billion Chinese, together China is pretty much as big as, as the US. And in the industrial world, of course, we have huge factories. You know, when we hear, when we speak of factories, it's often like, 100,000 square feet to a million square feet for a single story building. And that's for companies, for clients of ours coming from US, from Canada, from Europe, from Australia. They often surprised because they're a big player in their little city somewhere at home. And then they come here. It's like, oh, it's different dimensions. Price levels uh, actually surprisingly similar to what you often find in your home markets. But with real estate prices being similar to your home markets, uh, actually that forming a big portion of the cost. Because since labor costs over here are lower, but real estate costs are somewhat similar, that actually then forms a bigger portion of the cake. And that's again why, at least that's our pitch, we say that's why you need us, because that's a very important block and we got to make sure that you are safe and you get a good deal and all of that. Great point. And, and I'm glad you touched on the one part because that, that's one thing I was curious about is obviously you have to make a conversion. If you're going to compare rental prices, you have to make a conversion. I don't know what the one to the USD is right now. Is it, is it about a six or seven? One, uh, one US yeah. dollar is about six point something Chinese yuan. And then what, so what are you looking at for rental rates? Is everything quoted on a per square foot per annum basis? No, it's quoted on a per square meter okay. per month basis for industrial and per day basis for office. So hmm. you usually it's best to have an Excel sheet out there because once you do the triple conversion from dollar into yuan and from square foot to square meters there and from month to year, uh, it's very easy to, to mix things up. <laughs> yeah, I, as you're saying that, I was like, there's multiple conversions you have to do in there that that's not easy back of the envelope math to actually compare apples to apples and i'm guessing when people are looking in china and that's probably one of the first things that they have to figure out is just those conversion ratios so they can actually form a budget and determine what they can actually afford that's probably something that you're helping them with right at the beginning 
Definitely. And then, you know, there are so many things to it. Like, for example, when you rent, it's fairly easy. But in China, a 10-year rent is regarded as a long-term rent. Whereas in many Western markets, that's a relatively entry-level or short lease. And you have 10, 15, 20, 30. Here, you might have leases for just three, four, five years because the economy is developing so fast. So developers and landlords got used to having rates going up about 10% a year, and they would expect that for the future. So when you sign a 10-year lease, you're not getting a discount, but you have to pay a premium or you have to agree to a high rental escalation. Now, we as Westerners might say, well, who knows, maybe this upward trend is now flattening or will eventually even go down. So we may not want that. So it's sometimes that both the company, let's say the American automotive supplier or medical industry company or pharma company, whatever they are, they want a shorter period in China to be flexible. And the Chinese developer landlord wants a shorter period because they both uh, think the future might, might bring a lot of changes. And indeed, that has been pretty true over the in the past. You know, 15, 20 years ago, I brought companies from France, Germany, Holland, the US, Canada to Shanghai that set up factories. Nowadays, they're setting up offices and trading companies in Shanghai and they're selling to the Chinese consumer from Shanghai and they are moving out of Shanghai. They are moving 100 or 200 kilometers out of the city in order again to get, you know, environmental production quota, production quota as such, uh, talent and so on. So you touched on some of the big differences already of the money, the conversion is obviously one shorter term leases being another one. What are some of the other things that you've noticed that companies are surprised about when they come to China for the first time to look at the market? Well, the interesting thing is this, that China now has been very business friendly since the 80s. So more than 40 years. And a lot of the foreign companies enjoy that. And they enjoy the fact that China has been pretty stable, even in the Asian financial crisis, uh, whatever, and the end of the 90s, in the 2008-9 financial crisis, China was pretty much the only stable country, not affected, keep producing, keeping buying, helping the world out of the crisis. So China has been a good player in that sense. And also in China, you can get your money in and out because there are other countries where that tends to be a much bigger issue. So you set up your beautiful factory in, I don't want to name any of those countries now, but in, in other countries, and then at one point in time, you make a profit or you liquidate or you want to close down and you find out, oh, there are capital controls and you can't get your money out of the country. So China has been good from that end. Now, what people are, of course, surprised and shocked sometimes then to find out is that at the heart or at the core, theoretically, it's still a socialist communist country. So, for example, land cannot really be owned, but land is, you, buy, you are buying land use rights, LURs, land use rights for a period of, let's say, 40 or 50 years for an industrial land plot. And so what happens when you buy that land plot secondhand and 25 out of the 50 years have already passed? You know, on, you have a capital appreciation because land values went up a lot. But at the same time, you're saying, yeah, but what will happen in 25 years? So people say, well, how is that usually handled? The answer is nobody knows because it has never, ever happened before, because the whole system exists since about the 80s, 90s, because before that, in the 60s, 70s, it was truly collective. Everybody was part of a work entity and you worked somewhere and you got free lodging and free food. Whether that food was to your liking or not is a different question, but that was the system. And then it became a bit more of a market system. And that's what we have now. And now my picture is getting frozen, sorry about that. So now we have that open market situation, which is really interesting, but you still got to keep in mind, well, yes, there are certain rules. And for example, you, you would with your local bank, and sometimes the bank would regard itself a bit like a government entity that controls you and not purely like a service provider that does business with you. So there are a few, a few little things like that that you have to be aware of. Is the expectation that the government will just renew those land leases as they come up? Or is there is there any guidance on that at all? 
Yes, so there is a guidance even in the law saying for residential, for apartments, there must be a mechanism even for you to inherit it to your children and so on. So people expect that there will be a real estate tax implemented and maybe even following a little bit the US model, because right now we don't have a real estate tax in China. So maybe there will be a tax, but with paying the tax, you will then be able to renew uh, that thing. But for industrial and commercial, the law is a bit different. And we had ex uh, examples where a company had bought only 20 years because maybe that was cheaper or they, they didn't want to think 30, 40 years. So they bought, unfortunately for them, for only 20 years. Then it came up for renewal. And those examples are very interesting because then the conversation is around, okay, if I now buy for another 20 years, at what rate am I buying? Am I buying at the same rate as 20 years ago? Or am I buying at the current market rate? And in that one example we had, that's what they had to do. They had to buy again at the current market rate and they were not totally happy with it. But on the other hand, they were happy that they got to keep their factories because if the government would have just kicked them out, mm -hmm. that also might have been one way and then they lose their property. So now at least they got to keep their properties. And that's a bit how we how we see it often. You know, the government may not uh, be your best friend because the government wants your tax income. But the government also doesn't want you to leave. The government wants you to be here and to be profitable. And to your question at the very beginning, we have still an enormous amount of American and European companies setting up new production sites in China. There's a lot of talk about the reshoring, and I guess some of that is happening, and maybe with more automation. The question is then less about the cost of labor, and it's more about the cost of electricity and things like that. But we still see massive amounts of companies from all yeah, walks of life uh, that somehow set up new lines over here. And if they're doing that in parallel to this, I mean, sometimes I'm wondering because I hear all these stories everywhere. Are companies setting up new and Mexico is really booming, I believe. I'm wondering, does the world just need more and more production sites? Obviously, the world needs more and more logistics sites. So that is also a huge boom over here, which we can touch on in a moment, if you like, because I know that's also one of your real of your areas of huge expertise. So so that that is what we what we see over here. I, I had no idea that it was all on a, a land lease basis. I, I just, I guess, naively assumed that it was fee simple ownership like the rest of North America, but it makes sense in a socialist uh, area like China that I'm not surprised that instead of collecting ta property tax, they're just collecting rent. Uh, so it, I, I guess that leads to a question. Are you seeing more companies coming in and and purchase purchasing you renting the land essentially or are they relying on a developer or an owner to come in and, and do that and then they're just a tenant of the landlord who in turn is a tenant of of the chinese government that's a fantastic question because that's where just recently we are seeing a new change or a new trend so it used to be 10 years ago that the american company would come and what we call buy a land plot, but of course buy it for a limited time of 40 or 50 years, build their facilities, partly because that's what they were used to. They wanted their own standard. They wanted their own quality. And also because those buildings available from developers were often of a pretty low standard, low quality. But in recent years, the developers, they, we have a number of specialized industrial developers that build a lot of pro properties that are designed to fit the needs of most Western companies of different kind of needs, different ceiling heights, different kind of things, even humidity control and things like that. And companies more and more say also in a kind of de-risking approach, they say we want to produce in Asia, but we may not want to go all in with so many uh, dozens or hundreds of millions of dollars of investment. So we like to be asset light and we like to rent. And now comes one additional layer, which is the local government is heavily subsidizing foreign direct investment. So if you come as a foreign company setting up shop in China, you're obviously creating jobs, you're obviously creating revenue, maybe you're bringing knowledge, technology, all of that. So that is highly welcome. And if you rent a building, 
they give you huge subsidies bigger than if you buy because if they say if you buy the land you're occupying our resources for a long time we're already giving you a favor but if you're renting your premises you're not even we are not risking anything we give you more so now we have all these companies coming in saying well wonderful you know if i have a nice developer from shanghai or beijing or even from abroad or even let's say taiwan or hong kong uh, they are good at that game, you know, and they are building from Singapore. They are building me nice business parks. The government is paying my rent for the first few years, and I'm mm. getting basically free real estate. Plus, I'm getting other incentives for my renovation and for my tax income and for my talent housing for my staff. Well, great. Then you have pretty wonderful uh, yeah, circumstances to set up your, your new entity. You've been at NAI for a while, so you probably recognize the name Peter Lineman, right? Sure. I interviewed him last week and the topic of reshoring came up. And for all the reasons that you mentioned, he was skeptical that it's little, a little bit less, a little bit more than just lip service right now, because of, there's China is such a well-oiled machine when it comes to oiling machines and actually getting production out and, and the supply chain sophistication. Everything has been engineered around labor, access to materials, the ability to produce things quickly and at scale and then get it to market really quick. You can't just go to another area and expect to have that same level of sophistication at least overnight. So while the reshoring is definitely becoming a buzzword right now in North America, all the reasons that you mentioned are the reasons that China is still attracting companies and there's still a demand for, for companies to go there. You must be seeing the same thing, I'm guessing. Absolutely. And I'm glad to hear that because that's pretty much the first time anybody else is saying that. And I hear all these stories and all these illusions and all these beautiful pictures of, oh, finally, we will have our factory here back home again and so on, which even which also you would then have to ask the question, would you even have would do you need so many manufacturing jobs do you even have have labor for that but uh, the fact is uh, the situation over here is that for example we have an american chamber of commerce with something i think twenty thousand americans in shanghai and probably all over china i don't know maybe a hundred thousand and then we have a german chamber of commerce with about ten thousand germans living in shanghai and when we do service here among those german or american or french or whatever companies they we ask, you know, questions like, OK, will you expand your China footprint or reduce or keep it the same? And consistently, even during the COVID crisis, even the lockdowns, we had trends to grow, just growing less than before. But also what those CEOs say, the CEOs of the China entities, they say, we will not say that all that loud. And our global CEO in the US, he will never say that. And of course, a U.S. politician or a Canadian politician will not say that. So they always announce, oh, we have this new little thing here in, in Innovation Center, blah, 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 in the home market. But they not necessarily talk about, I mean, even Tesla setting up a huge factory over here and so on, you know, uh, one of those giga factories. Uh, that, that, is, that is the reality as, uh, as of now. And I think India is trying to position itself as an alternative. And Apple is now starting to produce uh, some of its iPhones, I believe, or iPads in India. But then, you know, then if eventually you have, instead of 100% of the items coming from China, only 95% of the items coming from China, it's still mostly China. And that's what happened some years ago, I think, to Calvin Klein underwear, you know. Then they move a little bit to Vietnam and a little bit to Bangladesh, but then you still have 90% uh of it done in china and those 90 percent because the volume is also growing the 90 percent today may be a higher figure than the 100 percent a few years ago so this is my the, the 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 market i see of course i may not see the ones that fail in china and leave and i believe there are foreign companies that tried to sell to china or try to produce in china and that failed but of course they disappear more quietly and the ones that i see on a daily basis are the successful ones you bring up a really good point on, on just misconceptions that are out there. And and I can't speak to the media in China, but the mainstream media in Western countries is biased towards sensationalism. And this is one of the reasons that I largely have stopped uh, reading and listening to the news. And I had this conversation with someone the other day 
that they love to latch on to anything negative. It must just be that it drives clicks or drives attention. But an example would be LeBron James. And I should, given the context that we're global on this with multiple different time zones, I'd probably use a soccer player or a football player instead of a basketball. But I'm going with LeBron. So let's say LeBron goes out one night and he scores 50 points. And then the next night he goes out and scores 25 points. The media will say, uh, LeBron James production is only 50% of what it was the last game, even though that 25 points might've been enough to help his team win. They always just seem to latch onto it. And I think coming full circle back to that reshoring thing, I think the media just loves to latch on to perhaps China is only going to see 10%. I'm just using random numbers here. Perhaps they only see 10% growth in production, but if it was 20% last year, the media is going to say China's production has slipped 50% even though it's still 10%. And, and I, I'm inferring based on what you're saying that that's not those you're numbers. You are spot on. on. You are spot on. That's exactly how it is. And there's an interesting thing to, to illustrate that, and that's the, the GDP growth. Because China used to have in the 2000s, whatever, five, six, sevens, have double-digit GDP growth. And then they said, oh, now the GDP is only single-digit, 9% and 8% and 7%. But in actual figures, that means China has over the past 10 years, each year added a GDP of a Sweden or a Netherlands or a Switzerland. So each year, China's GDP is growing by the whole GDP of Switzerland each single year. Just that nowadays, a growth of 6% is a Switzerland. And some years ago, you needed a growth of 10 or 12% to, to make a, a GDP of a Switzerland. So, and actually also, I think this is very healthy for it to go down. I don't think you can have a huge economy, let's say like the economy of the US or the economy of Europe, growing 10% for more than one or two years. That would be very unsustainable. So in a way, it is very healthy that China's GDP growth is now down to more like 5%. And of course, last year with the lockdowns, we had those three months of pretty crazy lockdowns that you saw in the media and so on. That, of course, hurt it. And for the first time, we had a quarter with no growth and so on. And maybe last year was in the end only 4%. But even that, 4%, for the world's second largest economy, that's actually a lot of growth. Like when you look at where is the global growth coming from, it's still a lot coming from over here. And another interesting example is that that makes China not only the factory of the world, but also a huge market. And I just saw uh, an announcement the other day that China has uh, 6,000 Starbucks stores. And the coffee is sold slightly more expensive than in the U.S. And they are planning to bring it up by another 3,000 stores over the next three years. So they're usually successful. Otherwise, they wouldn't add all these many shops. Or that Apple says China accounts for about 20% of its revenue. So in addition to producing for the whole world, Apple is also selling about 20% of its products in China. And that is a huge market. And also the products are not sold at any discounts. It's often the latest models and expensive models. And also that's also like interesting, like when you said that initially about these misconceptions, you know, when you come to Asia, a lot of the German brands did mistakes there. They came with their cars and thought, oh, it's a, not, it's a developing country. Let's give them the smaller, cheaper models. But actually, in a country of 1.4 billion people, you take the top 1%, that's still 14 million people, which are ultra uh, rich, high or ultra high net worth individuals. And they actually like the very luxurious cars and maybe also like to show it off. So you have that element as well. And then you have a Bugone, you have a racing middle class. Like, for example, the Shanghai, Jiangsu, Zhejiang area, the area where I'm living here, where we have a cluster of about whatever, a few dozen cities with about 200 million people. And in Shanghai, people have salaries of typically about 3,000 US dollars. 
So when you look overall China, you may see, oh, the overall income is on average only whatever, let's say a thousand or a thousand five hundred US dollars. Yes, but you have whole regions where the average income is three thousand US dollars. And that, of course, gives a lot of buying power and makes it that these companies, even Volkswagen, you know, Volkswagen says they make about 30 something percent of their profit in China. So China is probably for them the single biggest market. It's interesting from just a historical perspective, and I'm I'm a big industrial real estate nerd. I've studied the industrial revolution way more than I ever probably should have. But it's it's interesting at how like the UK industrial revolution largely attributed to starting the UK in the 1760s. UK has been essentially industrialized in over 250 years. You go to the US, they've been industrializing for 150 plus years. China has been industrializing in a small sliver of that time. So the UK and the US had centuries to really show and adapt to that industrialization. You uh, in China have condensed so much growth and industrialization into a short period of time that it was only inevitable that it caught up that all of a sudden that growing middle class, the the rich ultra rich class has all moved up accordingly. And it happens so fast. And in some cases, a, a generation or two. So you're right. I, I think that that's a really important point to note is that not only is China the world's factory, you're quickly becoming one of the world's largest consumers. Exactly. Even Apple, Tesla, all those bigger brands, uh, the fashion brands, the cosmetic brands, uh, it, it is a, it's a humongous market. And it's a single market, like a market mm -hmm. with one language, one currency, one banking system. It's not like in Europe where you have like little countries with each of them five million people and they each have their own currency and they each have their own this and their own that, you know. So, so that is also one thing that makes it, that makes it quite attractive. And right now we have cheap energy, you know, in Europe, energy prices are crazy expensive. China has cheap energy. That's another aspect that that makes people come here. Can you uh, dive into some of the individual markets a little bit more? Like, I'd be curious just to know how large the mar the industrial markets are. Uh, and I'm, I'm guessing you probably have more details or data on like the larger markets like Shanghai. But do you have any, even any idea of how large China's industrial market is by square footage? That's a very good question that I don't have. But what I can say is that it's a huge market, of course, in terms of industrial occupiers. For example, right, you have industrial occupiers having thousands and thousands of factories, but it's also a huge market for institutional capital. All the big pension funds, all the big private equity are pouring money into China. For example, logistics properties, but recently also even into manufacturing properties, into business parks and so on. And there we are talking billions and billions of US dollars. And you can imagine, you know, if a group like Blackstone or BlackRock or Carlyle or whatever pension fund, Brookfield, whatever, if they say, OK, we want to have X percent allocated to China. And maybe it's a small percentage, maybe it's three, four, five percent. But those are still billions of dollars that have to come into the market over here. And if you again think in terms of square, and that's usually either going into office or logistics or nowadays business parks. And if you think in terms of offices in Shanghai alone, we have about 300 office skyscrapers, about 300 office towers that have like in that range of 40, 50 floors. And so, so you can picture, so they have typically about 20,000 square feet per floor times 50 floors. And then you have somewhere in the range of three to 400 of them. So mm. that's, of course, a, a huge, huge market right there. Uh, on that topic, actually, Neil uh, had joined in and he had asked a question. Uh, thanks for joining in, Neil, and, the, and uh, great question here. What cities in China are most valuable for companies to have industrial property in and why? Well, if if I speak from my horizon, uh, then it is this area here, which we call the Yangtze River, River Delta. It is this area like from Shanghai, about one or two hours around. And we have those cities, you know, Shanghai has 25 million inhabitants. But then you have a city like Suzhou that has about 10 million. 
And then you have around Suzhou, a whole bunch of other cities, which each have maybe two, three, four, five million. You have cities like Kunshan, you know, cities that people not necessarily have heard about. Then if you are more in the e-commerce space and so on, we have, of course, Hangzhou, where we have the Alibaba headquarter and things like that. That's a bit more in the Western direction, but also just about two hours drive. Then you go north of Shanghai and you have an area... Uh, we have places like, first, of course, Taizang, which is very famous for production. Then you have Nantong. So you drive a good hour from Shanghai. You have a city with Nantong with also about eight or nine million people. And suddenly there you still have land available and you have all those good things available. So if it was for a company for their own use, I think that's where you would want to go. But if you are bringing in institutional capital, of course, you often want to play it safe. So you want to be relatively close to one of these tier one or tier two cities. You want to be somewhat in Beijing or in a neighboring city of Beijing, in Shanghai or a neighboring city, in Shenzhen or a direct neighboring city, an area where you know I will always be able to sell it, I will always be able to lease it out, and I will be pretty stable. And we can see that from return rates, from, from yields, like if you buy in Shanghai logistics properties, you get a return of about 5%. If you buy manufacturing properties, you might get a return of about 8%. But if you go a bit further out, maybe you get 1% or 2% more. So cap rates have already come down in Shanghai. It used to be more like in the 10% range for logistics. And then it came eight, seven, six. Now it's about five, some even sometimes even less than 5%. So in those attractive markets, cap rates contracted because of the enormous amount of capital coming in. So of course, you still want to make sure you have uh, an attractive return. But yes, I would also, if, if I'm a foreign pension fund, I want to, I, I go safety first. I say, give me a market where I know I can always sell it. So these pension funds, going back to that original topic about not actually owning the land, but entering into a lease essentially with the government, what are the pension funds and institutional investors, what is their stance on the uncertainty or, or is there certainty? Like, is there essentially an option that the owner has to renew that lease with the government? There is an expectation. But the thing is this, when they have these land use rights for 40 or 50 years, and they typically anyways operate with a horizon of only about 10 years, and the typical, like the local wealthy businessman, the local wealthy person here that invests into a property thinks of two things. He thinks of the rental income and of the capital appreciation. He, he thinks, okay, for sure this thing will be worth more in the future. And these funds, they are not really doing much of capital appreciation play. They just look at the cash flow. So they pretty much assume that the value will kind of remain stable and they can sell it at the end of the period at the same price as they bought it. Even maybe some years have passed, but maybe the value went up. And then if there's a capital appreciation well that's a nice add-on that's a nice bonus i think this is usually how they how they play it interesting yeah and and i'm a big believer in that as well is that that's as an investor myself i rely more heavily on the cash flow and principal pay down than than i do to bank on appreciation because that that goes up and down and anyone that's been privy to investing recently with interest rates going up you realize that the the value might have have, have come down uh, but if you have that cash flow and you have uh, your mortgage uh fixed or at least a, a, at a level where you're comfortable with having cash flow and principal pay down is never a bad thing either uh, exactly I, uh, a couple of people have just joined in. I just want to say hi to you real quick. Um, Ron joined in from Dallas. Uh, so we're co we're covered everywhere here, Bjorn. We've got uh, mul multiple different countries uh, uh, in on the call. Uh, Ron, uh, glad that you joined in. And uh, Beverly also joined in. Uh, she put your contact information. I still got a few topics we want to cover. So I'm not wrapping up with, uh, with your okay. contact information. But uh, Beverly, thanks for posting that. We've also got your website uh, in the description too. So oh, thanks we'll, so we'll, much. we'll talk more about how we get in touch with you in a bit. But I want to uh, uh, perhaps shift, or maybe I could use a buzzword of the year. We pivot. We're in a pivot towards technology. Uh, but if, if anyone does have any questions about China's market that I didn't cover, feel free to put that in the chat and we'll get Bjorn to answer them. Bjorn A. We, I, see, I, I can't I default back to saying Bjorn. Bjorn oh, A. Good, oh, good. 
Uh, and so I want to uh, pivot to technology because uh, we had talked before that a lot of the things that we think on the Western side that are future technologies uh, that, that are coming down the road are already being done in China. And a couple examples that, that you had talked about was drone deliveries and self-driving cars. So I'd love to get your thoughts on what's happening in that space right now and perhaps what we can expect coming down the road in, in, in the Western side. Well, my uh, view would be that these things are happening and probably happening much faster than people expect. You know, people say, oh, we are in the U.S. and legislation, different states will take 10, 20 years. Well, yes and no. You know, initially people said Uber would be forbidden because the taxi laws and the taxi. But finally, when people notice that Uber is really convenient, everybody wants it, then the policymakers and so on will find ways to also uh, accommodate that. So I think these things are happening. And of course, China, on the one hand, producing all of these things and experimenting and also in a way being able to produce a lot of those things somewhat cheaply, that helps them. Then China has a very centralized government, so they are very efficient. So if they do something right, they will be extremely efficient. If they do something wrong, unfortunately, they will also be efficient, but they are very efficient. And then they are smart that they often give certain areas, certain districts as trial runs. So you often have one district in a city where you now can have self-driving cars and then you have one city and then they roll it out if it is a success. And that trial city, that's often a benefit, a bonus. You're allowed to be the trial city. Of course, if something goes wrong, you're also the one being hurt. But that's how they run it. It's a very smart uh, system, I should say. And the self-driving cars work They work just well. I mean, actually, probably the Teslas also work pretty well already. It's just people are still not allowed to let them drive alone. But here we have some areas we have driverless taxis. So you can literally sit in that car and the car drives you and drops you off and it works. And it's, it's like weird the first one or two times until it's not weird anymore. You know, it's like you, you, you jump on a metro or whatever on a bus. You are also not necessarily saying hi to the driver. And with the drone delivery, that's another one. You know, the biggest problem is still the very last mile or in our case, if you're on a skyscraper, you know, The ideal thing would be the drone drops it off right in front of your window. That doesn't work. But what they did a bit is that drones would have boxes and they would again bring them to a place in front of an office tower and there would be the delivery guy handing it out to the right people. Things like that. Another area where we see where where China really, I think, is somewhat ahead of the Western world is the level of e-commerce. You know, like when... When I read that, okay, now in the U.S. and Germany and whatever, I, I don't know the latest figures, but when 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 we had about 20, 30 percent of e-commerce, China was already at twice that figure, and that comes again because maybe labor is cheaper, so delivery is cheap, but also because people are so open to new things. Because over the past 30, 40 years, things changed so quickly, and it was usually good changes. And another area is mobile payment. I think in China, something like 99.7% of payments are made with a QR code from your phone. And that QR code is linked to your bank. And you might say, well, how is that so very different from me swiping my credit card? Well, first of all, people in the Western world still often use cash. It's not everybody that swipes the credit card. And even with the credit card, it's a totally different thing. Your phone is on you. Your phone is in your hand. You flip it around. Your phone can have facial recognition. Your phone tracks. Your phone is linked to your bank account. I can, from my phone, transfer money to your phone, which then you can, from your phone, put it onto your bank account again. For the merchants, for the shops, it's this omni-channel thing in the retail world. You know, I'm standing in a shop. I'm looking at a thing. And I'm buying it. And it's not even clear, am I buying it in the online shop or in the physical shop? Because in either case, I now looked at it. I now press the button buy and it will be sent to my apartment. Whether it comes from the shop or from the warehouse or how that whole thing works, nobody really cares. So that uh, level of being open to to the digital world, that's something where China really is is very much at the at the forefront. And if that's a good thing, then they yeah they are ahead of us. And if there are risks, well, then of course we better all be 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 aware i mean now we have all these these automated uh, chatting programs and so on uh, some some of it is also scary uh, china is not afraid you know china somehow is very technic friendly as a european especially as a german we are very conservative like we are very scared of 
of new technologies and of the risks that they might bring. And China is just very bold on those. Uh, so I want, uh, oh, Ron said, great way to describe China. Yeah, it's, I, I, I love this conversation because I get so insulated in my own world that I, I tend not to think outside of North America as an example. It, it might even be more granular than that. Sometimes I don't even think outside of my own city or outside of my own house. So I love having these conversations because I, I feel like I've gotten like a, a ton of value just hearing somebody that's working in Shanghai for 19 years, not 11 years, 19 years, and to get the firsthand knowledge of what's going on. I find this so fascinating. And I'd love to get you to elaborate on a few of those points you made about technology. So on the self-driving cars, there's you mentioned there's taxis, you can get in, no driver in there. Are, those, are they driving on everyday city streets uh, or are they relegated to like a specific area where they have to operate out of no totally like any like any normal car like there there is pretty much no difference to a normal car in those area where they're permitted it's not like you have that in every chinese city everywhere but where they work they just they just operate like a like a normal like a normal car how and this might this is well beyond the scope of you and i talking about industrial real estate but on that self-driving car standpoint, how do you think they address risks or problems that occur? So what happens if one of those self-driving cars doesn't detect somebody walking across the street or perhaps it's someone running across the street and they just detect it too late and they hit them? Who, who's at fault in that in that scenario? No idea, no idea. <laughs> but that, of course, they're touching on a very interesting topic because in the Western world, we have a very strong concept of rule of law and the law is made and then the law is applied. And even if the law may seem unfair at a certain point, the law is the law. And China has that concept of we put the human being first. Of course, that then has that risk of, well, of misinterpretation. Oh, the law can once be interpreted like this and once like that. But China gives itself that leeway to say, well, look, we'll, we'll look at what really happened and what really makes, makes sense. So, um, they, they will probably figure that out. But I think the, un the understanding right now is there will be far less accidents. There will be mm -hmm. far less problems. The accidents happen because we are driving and looking at our phone at the same time. So, so that is, and of course, we have all seen these video clips of whatever Amazon and other warehouses having these robots. And that's also what you see on a massive scale over here, that you have these robots in warehouses. Uh, that deliver things and of course they are extremely fast and extremely efficient and then we have those things that I, th I know you have in the western world as well but he uh, here you, in every hotel you have these robots so you're in your room you, you realize you need a toothbrush okay room service is bringing it zzz, 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 the little robot comes and opens the thing and you take it and so on or you can check in with a virtual assistant or with a robot it's just like these things um this wave i feel is in china five years earlier than in the western world not that that makes a huge difference or not that that makes it so much better i'm just sometimes smiling or laughing when i see somebody take a video clip or put it on linkedin and say oh would the future look like that and we are going like yeah it does and and you may not even like it you know it's nice to talk to human beings i like to talk to human beings i'm i'm personally not the greatest fan of these robots but they work, you know, and they are fast and they don't need to take breaks and, and so on. So if you don't have to stand in line, certain you, you like the idea of the automated check-in. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. I there's there I would much prefer face to face, but there's there's a time and place for everything in there. And I'm with you on the self driving cars as well. It's I, I it, it's an, going back to that media bias question or media bias topic. This happens in the media too, where there's one self driving accident, and it gets covered by every major news outlet about how. The company, uh, there was an accident, this company's at fault, and that's one accident. But for all the reasons you said, all the people that are just bad drivers and neglectful or just get distracted, there's countless accidents all the time that don't get any coverage. But it's because there's, maybe it's just in Luddites and an inherent uh, aversion to technology that they're afraid of it. And I think it's all just driven by clicks. I think the media is just all about clicks. <laughs> it is, it is. Journalism is dead. It's all about sensationalism and clicks these days. I, I have one somewhat interesting, almost a bit sensationalist topic, which is also positive. So that's a rare thing. 
which is China has over the past about five, six, seven years gone crazy when it comes to environmental and green. So, and China was ignoring that for too long a period. So China was producing like crazy, but there was huge pollution. And you saw those pictures sometimes of the Beijing sky. You couldn't even see the sun. You thought it was cloudy, but it actually was smog. And about, yeah, maybe it's now already about six, seven, eight years ago, China said, we are now serious about environment, environmental protection, filters, clean. And a lot of people, including myself, didn't fully buy it. And now China is going all in on that shit. And that's really improving the quality of lives. It also makes it harder for businesses. Uh, but you, you, you can no longer, you know, use oil-based paint. You must can only use water-based paint and a lot of things in production. So it, it has its problems, but we have, and you can measure that, we have a much higher number of blue sky days now in many of the Chinese cities. And most of the buildings that are newly built have some sort of LEED certification and uh, other environmental certifications. So that's a, an interesting and very positive area, energy efficiency, carbon neutral, that a country like this, for whatever reasons, has identified that as a major driver, as, as something where they want to be at the forefront. And they're really like the actions, like they're really like willing to like have less GDP growth, less tax revenue, as long as it's more green. It's another thing that's not being covered in Western media. There's still <laughs> that perception out there that China is just burning coal at, uh, without any regard for the environment. Where I, I've, I've heard that from other people, though, is uh, what you're saying is that there is a movement towards more cleaner energy. So that, that's encouraging to hear that from you as well. Uh, on the, I wanted to ask also about the drone delivery because I'm fascinated with sure, this. Sure, sure, sure. So is that drone delivery from one warehouse? So let's just use Amazon as an example, because everybody was familiar with them. Will that be just Amazon that has drones coming to pick it up, pick up the uh, parcel and then deliver it either to the person's house or to the box in front of an apartment or office building? Or is there any, any company, uh, do they have the ability to have drone delivery from their warehouse? So I guess I'd just be interested in, is it restricted to, one particular company sending out one particular type of thing, or is it open market? Uh, potentially, it will be open market, but it's not rolled out on a, in a mass, uh, in a massive way yet. But what was done is that several little restaurants in one area that all might deliver to several big office towers in one area fill out fill up boxes with their individual items the drone picks up the box and delivers it to that other place and then all the people that have ordered food from any of these little restaurants along that area can get their food over there instead of individual uber eats drivers or uh, whatever Erlema or meituan drivers as they're called here taking them back and forth on their scooters that that kind of an of an application so it leads to the next question I have. If you're already five years ahead of Western technology or at least Western implementation of technology, where do you see the future in five years? Well, I'm pretty, I'm pretty scared in a way because I feel that, for example, now with more work from home, indeed, we need fewer office spaces. But with more eating from home, we need less restaurant spaces. And with more entertainment happening on our phone, we need fewer of everything. And with fewer of everything, we need fewer people servicing that. Because I feel a lot of people in society and in life, they derive a lot of meaning and a lot of importance from having, from doing their job. The job is not just the money you make, but it's about I'm contributing. And I see a risk that we need less, less people and less jobs. Uh, and that that's where things might be going and that is hard to replace. There are some new jobs, obviously, but when you have all the good movies and your on your phone, why do you go to the cinema and and so on? So I see risks there. Uh, one thing we have seen, for example, in the retail environment here, that nowadays our shopping malls have pretty much no or only 10% classical retail like shoes, fashion, cosmetics. And we have about 50% food and beverage and about 40% entertainment and education. 
So you have a huge shopping mall of about 10 stories, huge, huge mall, and you have almost no shop to buy any item because nobody would buy an item at the shop anyway. So now you have turned that mall into a temple for people to take spas, to take trainings, to meet people, to have all kinds of experiences, either for fun or for education or for whatever the thing might be. Uh, so there is there are some usage points, but then we also see that those groups, those whatever hairdressers or language training institutes or whatever dance clubs, they find it harder to pay those very high rents. So for a landlord, they have to make concessions. They have weaker tenants and they get less rental income, but at least they can still rent it out. Or, you know, finally you have some self storage in a, on the top floor of a shopping mall, that kind of a, that kind of a situation. If I'm a bit, if I'm a bit pessimistic here, um, other than that, on a, on a positive side, it is tremendously convenient when you take your phone you take your room you around and then you put in various furnitures and you look would that fit and the thing meshes and you take your phone or whatever device it meshes it out and finally so people over here would would even buy their furniture through their phone without going to a furniture store and it actually works and that's actually fun so so there are there's potential there uh so some some good things as well of course it sounds like there's a lot more appetite to buy things online through e-commerce in China than we're seeing in, in the Western world where shopping malls are still busy. Uh, th there's a lot of shopping malls in North America, probably to a fault, uh, but they're, the ones that are healthy and are doing well are still actually quite busy. So I, I don't think the Nor Western culture has caught up to China's culture and, and how much... Uh, you're buying online versus going to physical stores yes and maybe it never will and maybe it never should uh it also depends like of course we talked about that earlier once i think about with the potential uh, the mass adaption of self-driving cars would then people not have cars anymore and would they then uh what, how does their life look like one aspect here is that not every household has a car so if you go to the shopping mall and then you have to carry two huge bags and you put it on your Uber or you take it into the underground, that's less convenient. In the, in the Western world, you often have huge parking lots. You are, so in a way, you are forced to have a car. But once you have a car, you also use it. If you are not forced to having a car, you can't even afford a car or whatever, of course, your lifestyle would also be, be different. Well, one thing's for sure. I'm going to schedule a few years down the road to, to reach out to you again to have a part two on this because it'd be fascinating just to to eat, to look back on on what's changed on whether there's been some convergence of cultures uh, or whether there's it still keeps that divergence. So I, I do want to continue this conversation at some point, uh, but I also want to get to a few comments that uh, uh, that came in here before we wrap up. Uh, why if you could just uh, pull those up uh, in whatever order uh, estimating one discovering three I sorry I don't know your name I know you've commented on a few things and I greatly appreciate the comments I don't know your name it's just going to the handle uh, this is one of the most significant discussions in finance right now I agree I, I think uh, uh, people are not fully appreciating how important China is to the to the global economy for one thing not just from a financial standpoint but even just supply chain and distribution production manufacturing and you've shone a lot of light on this topic for me Bjorn, and, and it sounds like that's resonating with other people so thanks for that comment uh what else do we have here wyatt uh i oh sorry i know principals of u.s companies working in china and they're saying many of the same things so bjarni it sounds like you're uh you're you're definitely in tune with what's happening in the uh, at companies out there as well uh we'll be slaves to the technology once we have no more work or thinking to do yeah it's it's a it's a discouraging thought and and i i don't disagree it's that this one of the things that scares me about this metaverse uh and and i don't know if that's coming is if that's percolating in china or not but i i it scares me to think that people are just going to be wearing these VR visors and living their entire life out there. But I suppose we're living on a flat two dimensional screen for a good part of our lives as well. So I don't, I, I'll, I'll get your comment on that in a second, Bernie, but uh, uh, thanks for all the comments on this too. Much appreciated. Uh, even commercial industrial development will be dominated by algorithmic decision-making replacing the human benefactor. 
yeah, that's uh, everyone's probably familiar with that chat GPT that's come out and just how, how adaptive and responsive that machine learning and language processing models can be. It's, it's really equally part scary and encouraging on what that's capable of doing. Uh, do you have a couple minutes, Bjarni? I don't want to wrap up too quickly. Well, on that last one, like we, we, we found that doing good real estate appraisals in China can be challenging given all these things about land use rights and granted land use rights and allocated land use rights. And it's just a complicated thing. Like what do you do it based on replacement value, whatever. And we are now starting to experience with the jet GPT thing, because I think we found methods to do a good job to predicting what could a property sell for within the next three to six months. And I believe the software could probably do the same thing, as scary as that is. Like, I think we could relatively easily teach that thing or that thing could ob observe what we are doing and then do the same thing, potentially. I, I think the world is going to look fundamentally different five years from now, just as a result of AI. And it's for everybody that's a Terminator fan, the, the Skynet reference, I, I don't even know how far off that is. Like it's b before that we hit singularity and, and you watch Boston dynamics on what they're capable of producing for some of their robotics. You combine the two. One of these days, if, if that computer ever wakes up, uh, we, we might be living <laughs> Terminator as scary as that is to think. Uh, well, let's not end on that. Why you're in Malta, you're probably going to the beach tomorrow Do we have any positive comments we can wrap up on this uh that came in uh what is virtual reality in china now compared to the west uh like you said about buying furniture online are there uh, other things people buy that way sure even even fashion even even tailor-made dresses you can do you put your phone in front of you and then you turn around a few circles it films you it meshes you things like that are in place and also since you just mentioned these these funny glasses you know people use that and they are in the workshop and they have an expert at the other side of the world seeing the same thing that guy sees telling him oh put that screw a little up have you tried to shake it a bit you know you have a very special laser a special microscope and you would need usually in the past you needed the expert to fly in once or twice a year now you say put on the goggles put on the glove and now we do figure we two figure that out together and you have saved uh, many days and many dollars so so that's an application that we see used in in a lot of factories we're definitely having part two of this at some point down the road. Uh, I saw there was one comment from Harry. Uh, if we could pull that one up and then we'll just uh, leave off on this one. Uh, both with NAI, I'm actually in an interview process uh, with an industrial broker to learn uh, under. He is also with NAI. Yeah, small world, Harry. And, and great to connect if, if Bjarne or I can ever be of help. If uh, we're, I would both be more than welcome to. Uh, Bjarne and I are actually both SIOR members and we met We'd, we'd been connected online before, but we met in Dallas uh, at the SIOR conference. And it's awesome to continue this conversation uh, with you. Are you going to Montreal by chance in April? I'm hoping. I can't say it for sure yet. But also uh, to underline what you just said, Harry, if we can help in any way, any time. And also uh, I have a quite interesting YouTube channel, the Crazy Buildings channel. So there I also cover some of the crazy buildings we have, the Shanghai Tower with the 126 floors and some of the billion dollar real estate transactions. So if, if anyone, Harry, you or others are interested, check that out. Crazy buildings, crazy buildings, China. Thanks for mentioning that as well, because I do have your LinkedIn and your website, but I'll, I'll add that. I, I'll pin that as a comment uh, as well on, on your YouTube channel, because it's Thanks a, it's so a great much. channel and, and very, uh, very interesting just to get another perspective on that. Uh, so thanks everybody who joined in and, and all the comments. Uh, I, I always like to say, if you like this, hit the thumbs up button. If you didn't like this, see, look at that. Even why has got the thumbs down. If you didn't like this, hit the thumbs down button. We're, we're always looking for feedback uh, here, good or bad. So, uh, uh, let us know. Uh, again, thanks for tuning in. Really do appreciate uh, everyone's time. And Bjarni, most of all, thank you to you for, for taking the time. I know this is really early in the morning for you, so I'm sure you're going uh, to, to get some well-needed sleep. But thank you once again. I, I hope I get to see you in Montreal. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Have a good day.